about just saying a little bit about yourselves because I know only Bryn and Andrew really got to work with you at the clinic and everyone else mm -hmm. had Tatiana. Okay, sure. Um, so we live in New Jersey. Um, I was born and raised here and I'll tell, I guess I'll tell you guys how I got involved in the sport and then you can tell them how you get involved. I started out, out in Taekwondo, which is kind of like karate. And I got my black belt and I was dead set on staying in, in martial arts. That's what I love to do. And then the school shut down and there wasn't really any other martial arts schools nearby. And so my mother said, well, you're, you're short, you're flexible, you're fast. Um, and you're not going to be tall. You're not going to be stocky, right? Because no one in our family is over six feet tall. Not my great, 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 great grandfather. And so um, she said, you can either be a jockey, right? Someone who rides on horses, a cheerleader or a gymnast. And I was like, I don't want to be any of those things, right? I want to keep doing martial arts and kick people and fight people. And so she brought me to the local gymnastics gym and it was awesome, right? There's trampolines and foam pits and bars and spring floors and contests and games. And I just absolutely fell in love with it. And while I was taking some classes, uh, Tatiana, who you guys have, uh, most of you guys have met, had just moved to America from Russia and she was starting a trampoline team. And when my mom came to pick me up from class, she said, would you be interested in, in putting him on the trampoline team? My mom says, no, that sounds too dangerous. So then my, the, my father was picking me up from class one day and she said, you know, your son's pretty talented. Would you want to put him on the trampoline team? And my dad said, yeah, sure. Let's sign him up. So I, he signed me up for the team and I just started, I started training already like five days a week, two hour practices from when I started when I was 10 and I went from there all the way five days a week, six days a week, sometimes seven days a week, all the way up to the Olympics. And how did, why don't you say how you got involved? Um, so I also started as artistic gymnastics. I was swimming when I was six years old. And when I was seven, my mom wanted me to, to put me in a different sport in another sport because I still had a lot of energy at home and I really wanted to do volleyball. But same thing as Steven, I'm only five foot tall. And my mom was like, mm, we can try volleyball, but why don't we try gymnastics also? So volleyball didn't work so well. I was bumped and I stuck with gymnastics. It was artistic at a point. And a year later, I was only staying in the trampoline in the gym. We had a little trampoline on the ground. And my coach was like, we want to try a trampoline team since we were there all the time. So I'm like, sure. And then when I was eight years old, I tried a trampoline team. I was already doing flips and my coach was like, oh, like we, we want you. So I joined the team. And from there, I just started training more and more, more days a week, more hours until I made the national team. And here I am, I still compete. And I'm training to qualify for Tokyo next year. Awesome. Uh, I know a lot of kids at our gym see more um alexa stop <laughs> and <laughs> i know a lot of kids in our gym uh, have more of a appeal to artistic gymnastics like um bars beam vault mm -hmm. what what brought you from artistic to wanting to do trampoline um i mean well number one duh because it's more fun <laughs> right um you know, that was something that I always, I always enjoyed doing, you know, and um, secondly, when I watched some of the older athletes, which I look back at now, what they were doing was like level seven or eight stuff. And I was like, wow, look at them go. That's amazing. I want to learn how to do that. I wonder what that feels like. Um, so that interested me. And then lastly, um, I fell in love with coming to practice and constantly learning something new every single time, right? I was learning to do something better instead of lunge, kick, handstand, hold, lunge, kick, handstand, cartwheel, 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 right? So like in artistic gymnastics, you just spend so much time 
you know, mastering the same move. Whereas you can learn to master the skills without having to do it over and over and over again. Right. So like in order to, a tuck position, right. You can do a tuck jump on off the double minute. You can do a tuck jump on floor. You can do a tuck jump on tramp. You can do a tuck up on the ground. Right. There's so many different ways to do that one move, but in gymna artistic gymnastics, it's like, there's really not, you're only doing that one move again and again and again and again. So you really have to be passionate about that sport in, in order to, to, to stick through all of that, those tough times. What drew you to trampoline? Well, like I said, when I was doing gymnastics, I only wanted to stay on the trampoline. I don't know. I think once I was in the trampoline, I didn't want to leave. And I just um, loved the feeling of flying. And that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to do bars. I didn't want to beam. I, I just didn't like it. I wanted to be flying in the air. And then um, they told me to try the trampoline team. And I loved it. So um, if you guys don't know, my kids, um, Steven's brother, Jeff, is an active trampolinist. Um, mm -hmm. So did Jeff get into trampoline and gymnastics because of you? Yeah, kind of. So I, I got involved in some artistic classes and then I switched to trampoline team. And right around then, I think he started taking rec classes as well and then he was he was younger than me he was like six or seven and so the artistic team didn't want me because I was already nine and a half almost ten years old so for them I was too old but my younger brother was there he was like prime age so he went on the artistic team for like a year or two and then he saw me learning all these moves and doubles and jumping higher and while he's over there you know, just doing leg lifts, lunge, kick, handstand, right? And all these like, not boring, but tedious moves. And so then eventually he's like, all right, I'm switching. So he switched, not uh, maybe after a year or two of artistic Nicole team. Nicole big brother. Yeah. <laughs> so you're retired now. What uh, brought you to that decision? Yeah, it's a good question because once I, after the Rio Olympic Games, I was, I was not burnt out, but I was like, I need a break. Now, here's what, here's what happened. Um, I'm passionate about coaching. I love coaching, right? And I, when I went to nationals and regionals, I didn't get to coach my kids that I was coaching at home because I was competing, right? And I didn't get to travel to other gyms and, and teach other, other clubs and, and do these camps and clinics because I had to stay home and train six days a week in training. And so, and I, I wanted to finish school. I had like a year and a half left of, of school left. And there's all these things that I wanted to do that I had to put on hold because my life revolved around training. And it's not that I, I didn't want to compete anymore because I still want to compete. I still do. It's just that it's impossible to compete at that level and also travel on weekends to coach other kids and, you know, go to other gyms and, you know, be on the floor coaching 10 hour days at nationals. Um, and I just wasn't really ready to, to keep putting those, those off. Um, and the, the, I think the one thing that really, I was like, that, that pushed me over was I was like, I just need a sign. Is it time? Should I be done? Should I keep going? I can, like, I'm, I'm healthy enough to keep jumping. And then this position for the junior national team head coach um, became available. And they said, well, you know, we would love to have you in this position. And I said, yeah, I would, I would love to. And they said, well, you can't, be the national team head coach and be on the national team as well. So you'd have to retire. So I said, okay, there's my, there's my sign. Right. So I still get to travel with the national team, I, you know, and I still get to go to these competitions and help just as a coach. So it was, it was a, a really fantastic transition for me. Awesome. Uh, Camila, you coach also, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think he does seem funny, <laughs> but I do. <laughs> yeah. Do you enjoy coaching more or? being an athlete, being coached? Uh, I like both. 
Um, I, the part of coach that I love is when the kid, when you see the kid improving, right? Is and you think like, oh my god, I taught that kid how to do this, and like you see their happiness on their face, like when they learn a new skill, when they land a front flip, or when they stick on the double mini. So I think that feeling, since I'm, I'm still an athlete, like I know that feeling, and uh, he knows it too, since he was an athlete. So it's that's the good part that I love on coaching. And uh, being an athlete is just, um, I love to still get better every day, show up every day. And of course, the part of traveling, making friendships that last forever. Um, we have friends from all over the world. So, um, so I love both. It's hard. It's kind of like, which son do you like better? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's hard to answer. But, um, but yeah, I like both. Mm-hmm. Um, I know ETA is primarily trampoline, but I saw you guys started competing, like, tumbling in double mini, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's something you guys yeah. athletes, or is that something new? Well, we we always had a double mini. Our run our run up wasn't that long, so our run up got a little bit longer, and then we just bought an acro sport uh, rod floor, um, and it's a full full floor and landing. There's no run up though. But we have that like downstairs spring floor area. So tumbling was always part of our um, training regimen, but it was, we never really competed it. Um, and double mini, the athletes have been always, they have to compete double mini until they become an elite. Once they become an elite, whether it's on double mini or trampoline, then they get to choose. Do you want to keep doing multiple events or do you want to you know, really focus on just double mini or just trampoline? And most of the time, the athletes say that they want to focus on just trampoline, and we're okay with that, you know. Um, but sometimes a lot of the athletes will stick on double mini, stick to it, and they'll they'll be become elite on both. Um, but as far as since we just got a rod floor, I think the highest level tumbler we have is eight or seven, maybe going eight. Um, but we we just got a rod floor. Uh, January, January, December. Yeah, January. Yeah, January. Okay. Um, you mentioned how, uh, I mean, I know the answer to this, but I think it would be good for the kids to um, hear from you guys. The benefits of training tumbling when you like trampoline more would rather only compete trampoline. Yeah, so like I said, we, we trained, even when we only had a spring floor, we had, the athletes had to tumble. And it's absolutely crucial imperative to the training right so i would do passes for instance on like we had a 40 by 40 artistic floor but we would do a round off backhand spring arabian step out round off double full right or round off whip handspring handspring double tuck and we would do these these on the floor for strength for speed for coordination um And I think it's super, super important. So, I mean, for strength, it's probably tumbling's the best conditioning that you can do for this sport, right? And um, it's also necessary that the athlete doesn't memorize a flip, but rather is a master of aerial awareness. So what I mean by that is if you jump two second um, time bounces, and you do your back tuck every single time at two seconds, stopwatch, right? Then you have you map you memorize the timing of when to kick out, right? So it's important that you don't just memorize the timing. You do back tucks at one second, at one and a half, at two seconds, right? You do it on the floor, you do it on the double mini, you do it on the trampoline. So this way you're not just tucking and kicking out the same exact time, but you're understanding how high am I, how fast do I need to rotate, where should I kick out? right and you don't really get that when you only train on the trampoline at the same height pretty much all the time so yes tumbling is absolutely absolutely important (laughs) Um, and i think camila camila didn't really tumble much in brazil and now she tumbles more right as an elite athlete you started doing standing back tucks back handsprings right round offs aerials all that stuff you started already as a senior elite athlete right yeah i think once i moved here I saw how important it was um I wasn't I didn't learn much drills and much stuff like we do here in Brazil unfortunately but since I started doing that more and more um I could see like how much I improved in training uh, on the tramp like my height and speed and everything 
Okay, very interesting. Um, how are you guys, I mean, Camila, you're a competitive athlete still. How are you guys maintaining that during the time where we're not allowed in the gym? Uh, I think the first few weeks was a little hard. Um, I didn't know what to do and I had so many, I was like, I just need to work out and I wanted to be working out all day because I didn't want to lose like any strength. I didn't want to lose anything training. And then I was, was like, this is not the right thing. I need to focus on having a routine so I won't go crazy. So I try to stick with the routine that's similar to my normal routine, but at home. So I wake up, I eat breakfast and I usually go to the gym. So I I train at that time, I train at home. Um, and then um, I'm also a nutritionist, I'm a nutrition coach. So I'll have lunch and then I'll work. I'm not coaching, but I'm working as a nutrition coach with my mm -hmm. clients. So I just try to stick with that routine so to feel more like normal in this craziness that we're living. Um, and then of course with the Olympics being postponed, it was, a, like, it, it was really hard, but kind of of course a relief for all the athletes. We don't have to be doing so much and like maybe you can get injured. You don't, you're just training at home, right? You don't have anyone looking at you. So I think that was a relief for us. And right now, yes, I'm just sticking to that routine and hoping that the gym will open soon. Yeah. Um, what kind of exercise are you doing? I know you guys are into CrossFit and weightlifting. Yeah, uh, we also coach CrossFit, so he coaches the morning class on CrossFit, and I, I work out, and um, we, we're lucky enough, we got some stuff from our gym, so I have a barbell, I have some weights, um, we, I can run here in the neighborhood, so yeah, we, I stuck with weightlifting and some CrossFit style mm -hmm. workouts, and a little bit of yoga for flexibility, <laughs> How has um, like CrossFit and weightlifting benefited uh, just jumping and being a trampoline athlete? Yeah, um, I mean, when I started doing, um, well, I think I think I have to be careful too with like CrossFit because um, depending on the coach, depending on the programming, CrossFit could be potentially dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. And it could also be potentially not beneficial right so for example um trampolinists we don't need much upper body strength you need some right to be able to support your takeoffs when you're jumping high so like you don't need to be doing so many presses and bench press and handstand push-ups right so we had a crossfit coach that kind of helped program crossfit style workouts geared towards our sport specific right so a lot of like power movements, a lot of box jumps, a lot of um, kettlebell swings, right? Um, we would build some strength in our like deadlift and squat, but that wasn't our goal, wasn't necessarily to max out on our, our squats, right? Um, now we did lift heavy, right? But we, again, we, we had intentions with what we were doing. So it's not like you come in and the part of the part of CrossFit is constantly varied and constantly unknown. So you're not, you're not program anything. Every day is different, right? It could be a three minute workout, could be a 50 minute workout. And so that's not, you know, what we were necessarily, uh, we didn't need overall fitness. And I think some people do, and I think it's great, you know, but we wanted sports, sports specific. So we've, we've kind of learned over the years being exposed to all these different movements, um, what works and what doesn't work. Um, so yeah, we do a lot of, she'll do, Camila will do a power training, right? She'll, and then how many, three times a week mm -hmm. where she's just working on explosive movements, anything from sprints to cleans, to snatches, to single leg box jumps, to long jumps, to jumps with the weight vest on, right? So all these explosive movements. And then how many days a week do you do CrossFit? Like oh, generalized fitness. Three? Yeah, so then she'll do three days that and then strength how many days? No, not now. Not now. No. Yeah, so it's yeah, this. Some classic class. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's like six workouts a week that she's doing based on weightlifting and CrossFit. And then I just I started doing weight, uh, weightlifting to help my uh, trampoline. And then after I retired, 
I liked it so much that I started having like setting little goals and I started competing in weightlifting and I competed at our, at a national event just in March at the American open. Um, and it just gives me an opportunity to get on that stage and compete, you know, get that adrenaline rush again. Um, can't get that away from him. Yeah, no, <laughs> uh, I'm an addict. <laughs> um, changing gears a little bit. Um, going to, uh, uh, competition mindsets. What are some things you do like before and during big competitions to kind of mentally prepare yourself? You want to start? Sure. Um, I started maybe a year or so ago with um, visualization. So every night before that, I would close my eyes and think about the routine I want to do. So I would think about perfect routine. But not only that, I would also see routines with mistakes so I know how to deal with that you don't want to just think about perfect routine and then you're on the trampoline it's trampoline right it's never perfect so if you see a mistake you're going to be ready for it you don't want to get to the competition do a mistake and then freak out that's the worst thing in the trampoline so I think visual visualization helped me a lot and also um, I meditate too so before the competition um, before I start warming up I take three to five minutes, maybe 10. I will, um, I have an app on my phone. You can find a bunch of apps. The one I use, it's called Calm. And I pick some music and I just close my eyes and I do the same. I see the routine, I stay calm, or I just focus on my breathing. I think when you start learning um, how your breath works, that makes you calm when you're nervous. So I think for me, those two things helped me a lot to, to get where I am now. Um, it's visualization and meditating for sure. And I think when I was competing, I mean, I was always searching and trying to find new stuff. And I think that that search never really ends. You don't really find what works perfectly. Um, but some of the things that I would do is, is I would have my mental flow chart, right? Which it looks like some of you guys have, have already done. And I would have those keywords ready to rock and I would visualize my routine like Camila. And I would say those three things in each skill, right? So if my first skill is trip as pike, it might be chest up, pike deep, heel drive, right? Or big heel, something like that. And I would, do, and I would say these skills in, in my head as I was visualizing my routine. And so after enough times, I felt confident, like, okay, I can do it. I just got to remember those three things per skill and everything's going to be fine. And, um, if I was really, really, really nervous, I would, I would tell myself this statement and it's so, it's so strong. I don't think it has ever not worked. I would tell myself, you don't have to do this. You don't, you really don't just go. You don't have to compete. No one's making you don't compete. Just scratch, chill out, watch the competition and go home. And then after, you know, hearing myself say that I would think, well, no, I, but I want to compete. I want to. And then that change of mindset would lead me to becoming confident and eager to go out there and perform well. Instead of nervous to fail, I was uh, excited to do well. Um, and so that, that helped me a lot. Yeah, I like that. Um, do you guys want to talk about maybe worlds or competing in the Olympics? What the experience is like? Sure. Go on. You have a story. So I can tell you a couple of things from the, um, from the Olympic games. Um, number one is the cafeteria. The cafeteria is probably the size of three or four Costco's or Sam's club, whatever you have nearby, like three or four of them. See this massive, you can't even see the end of the, the, uh, cafeteria is so big. And they have these little, buffet stands, restaurant things. Um, and on top, it has a giant banner of which country it was. So they had food for our restaurant and food like buffet from the United States, Canada, Mexico, Jamaica, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, China, Philippines, Taiwan, right? So literally every single country all the way around. So after the competition, I went and tried to eat a little bit from every country all the way around the world. Um, and also in the cafeteria, they have a full on McDonald's like restaurant, oh like the whole thing inside a whole McDonald's with a roof and everything built inside of this cafeteria. 
and you go up and you order and you can order 10,000 chicken nuggets and 500 Big Macs and they'll type it in, give you a receipt and you don't pay a dime. It's wow. all, all free. The second thing, the second thing from the Olympic games, um, that's uh, one of my favorite stories is when we were, um, marching for the opening ceremonies, there was, I think the United States delegation was like something like 500 people or a little over 500 people. And almost every athlete walks unless they're competing in the next day or the day after. And everyone's wearing the same uniform. And there was people that I didn't know. And then uh, over to my left was Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, uh, Kevin Durant, um, all these like basketball superstars. And it was awesome that they were just walking around shaking hands, talking, and there was like superstars and people I didn't know. And everyone seemed like best friends because we were all wearing that, you know, that flag, that Team USA uniform. So it didn't matter what your background was or what your sport was or how famous you were back in USA, right? Here, we're all part of the same team. And that was a really, really special moment for me to, to, to feel. And then the third and final story is um, during on competition day. So I'm in the warm-up hall, right? They said, warm-up is finished. Everyone, please come line up. And we line up. Everyone's shaking hands. Good luck, good luck, good luck. I got my headphones in, my game face. I'm like, okay, you got to stay, you know, don't let anyone know your emotions. Don't let anyone know that you're scared. Don't let anyone know you're excited, right? Keep calm and just stay focused. And I'm getting my game face ready. And they, they're like, okay, and here we go. And they open the doors and you just hear like the audience, 20,000 people, I think it was, or 25,000 people cheering. And here I am, the only American competing today in this arena with 25,000 people in England, right? So no one comes to our national championships unless you're like a parent or an aunt or a relative, right? So trampoline is not like a spectator sport. So I'm expecting if I can't even get fans in USA, then I'm not going to have anyone here besides like my parents, right? My family, some of my teammates. Um, and then I walk out and I look up and there was at least 1,000 American flags, just a sea of American flags around, just people screaming their heads off, waving their American flags. And like, I was trying to keep my game face and I just like was smiling ear to ear. And I felt like such a little, little kid because I couldn't stop smiling. And I was like, Steven, you have to get your game face on. Stop it, you know? And it, it was one of the most special moments I ever felt. You know, I felt such patriotism that these people were complete strangers. Yeah. I have never seen them before, and I will probably never see them again in my entire life. But for that moment, we were together, you know? And they were cheering for, for me, and they had never met me. So that was something really, really, really special. Do you have any stories from our championships? Can't even compare to your story. <laughs> no, I think um, for me, like worlds is there's just like nationals. Not all the time is like a big crowd. It's more like athletes and coaches. So for me, I always took every competition the same competition. If if it's a state, if it's nationals, if it's worlds. So I don't have a crazy story like he does. But um, it's just really good when you're there and then you realize like you're one of the best in your country and you're there representing your country. So you're not representing only you, but uh, a lot of people, right? A lot of people got your back. They're all cheering for, um, for you. So um, I remember my first Pan American Games. It was a similar story as him. Um, I walked to the arena. It was in Canada and the were the not world, but Olympic champion and the Pan American champion, they're all Canadians. So I'm like, it's gonna be all Canadians. And I walked in and there was a lot of Brazilian flags, people yelling my name. And I had no clue like where they're from. And it, it's a really, really good feeling. So that's kind of my story. <laughs> Does anybody have questions for them? If you do, just like raise your hand in the video. You can unmute yourself. Go ahead, Thomas. Um, growing up in gymnastics, um, do you have anybody who you specifically looked up to or anybody who you like idolized? Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, for me, I mean, I'm much older than you guys, and this guy's much older. You, probably, you, you might not even know who he is. So, but Alexander Muskalenko um, from Russia was. You guys know who Dong Dong is. Yes. So he was the Dong Dong before China started winning everything. So today, China wins everything. But it wasn't that way. China only started winning everything in 2007. Before that, Russia won everything, every, all, all the years. And so Alexander Muskalenko was a five-time world champion. He won the Olympics, the very first Olympics in 2000, uh, when trampoline was, was um, incorporated. And he won everything. And so um, how many, do you guys ever watch trampoline YouTube videos? Yeah, cool. So I suggest you guys go back and look at the history and look at where the sport has come from, all right? Um, I know I started with Nuno Marino, we started a podcast and we kind of bring some people in that from, from the history. So it'd be fun for you guys to listen and we post some old videos. Um, and maybe find someone who you guys idolize. Um, so yeah, Alexander Muskalenko is mine. Who is yours, Camila? Um, I had another Russian was Irina. Karaviva. Irina Karaviva. I don't know if you guys know her. She was she's a big name in the sport. And besides her, um, I also idolize Rosie because uh, I wasn't in the elite level when she started. I saw where she was coming from, where she is right now. So I and now being able to compete with her and prize with her is uh, pretty good. Um, I still look up to her uh, to things that she does in the sport. They have more questions. <laughs> yeah, Molly, why don't you go ahead and mute and ask us a question? Um. So, how? What did you? What were you scared of, and how did you get through it? What was I scared of? So I was always scared of failure. I was always scale, scared of, of falling, of people expecting me to win and I wouldn't win. Um, and what did I do to, to, to make sure that didn't happen? I worked my butt off, right? So I did as many routines, sometimes more than what the coach told me to do. So that I was certain that there's no way I can mess up this routine, right? Um, and if I sometimes if I did five optionals or six optionals, I'd say you know to my coach, "Can I do another one? I, th I think I can do it better. I just want to make sure I can do this skill properly or that piece properly." And I just worked and worked and worked and worked and worked, and I I never ever stopped in training. If my feet were one inch from the springs, I would continue my routine because you never know in competition when that's gonna happen. So I did every single thing I could in training to make myself as consistent as possible. What about you? What were you scared of or are scared of? I mean, I agree with him. Um, I think you never know what are you scared of if you don't try. So you always gotta go for it and try your best and see what happens, you know? Most of the time, it's a good thing. You have something, what happens next is a good thing and you move on. And you're not scared anymore. Um, and uh, there's something too. If you get hurt on a skill and you get scared of that skill, I had that with one of my favorite skills. It's the Miller. It's a double layout to a triple twist. I, I sprained my ankle really bad, and I had to deal with that for over two years with um, a sprain and then a stress fracture. But then when I went back to do the skill, I was very, very scared. You can ask him. But it was still one of my favorite skills. So I had the adrenaline of being scared, but wanted to do it. And once I did it, it was a really good feeling of overcoming that fear and doing something that I love. Another question. Yeah, Andrew, you had a question? Yeah, what was um, like your reaction to like making it to the Olympics or like the, like, mm -hmm. Biggest yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. So um, in 2007, going into two th in 2008, I was one of the best senior elites and I was supposed to go to the Olympic Games in 2008. And 
I ended up falling on my last skill in the last Olympic trial, which, so I didn't get to go to the 2008 Olympics. And then I'm like, do I really want to spend four years of training and working my butt off and crying and all the things in between? And I said, okay, yes, I'll do it. And then in 2012, I won the first Olympic trial. I won the second Olympic trial. At the third and final Olympic trial, I was first place going into the finals. The finals starts over from zero. So second place in that final, I would not have gone to the Olympics, right? So even though I won the first one, won the second one, was first place going to the finals. If I got a second, I wouldn't go. So like that was the most stressful time of my life. I was so nervous that I threw up before the competition. And then once I finished my routine and I knew that I had uh, secured my spot to go to the Olympic Games, I cried. It was like, and it wasn't, it wasn't, it I didn't, it wasn't like sobbing, right? But I just had some, some tears of, and it wasn't even of joy. It was of relief, right? I had so much pressure on myself, you know, that it was finally over. And I was just so, so happy. And then after that kind of relief went away, it was like, it was like Christmas for like six weeks before the Olympic Games. All right. I was like, I'm going to the Olympics. I'm going to the Olympics. And every day was training was fun because I knew I had already made it to the Olympics and I get that, that pressure was kind of like off. I mean, there's still a lot of pressure to do well, but, um, yeah, get, just getting to the Olympics was the most pressure. So it was awesome. <laughs> Anyone else have any other questions? Yeah. Bryn? Uh, how did you know that you wanted to become a trampolinist? Because, I mean, you could have done anything. You didn't even have to do gymnastics yeah. or trampoline, but how did you know that you wanted to do that? It's so for me, I didn't, right? My mom signed me up for gymnastics pretty much against my will. I wasn't something that I was really excited to do. Um, but I did enjoy the trampoline. And then once I joined the trampoline team, I fell in love with learning. And that that pride right and I think you guys all know this feeling when you get your back full for the first time or you learn your branding for the first time or a double back or you stick a skill or you got your Rudy for the very first time it's like the most exciting feeling in the world right and so that's what I like became addicted to and I worked really 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 hard because I just really wanted to feel that again with the next skill and and it wasn't always skills it was sometimes doing what my coach asked right and my coach would be like, I need you to do it, you know, perfectly with the arms in tighter, 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 tighter. And then finally I did it perfect. And my coach would be like, yes, that's it. Boom. That same feeling. So it didn't only come from skills, but it also came from doing it skills the right way as well. So, and that, I think it came pretty quickly to me once I started doing trampoline that I fell in love with that. What about you? How did you know you wanted to be a trampolinist? I don't know. <laughs> just, just came, came naturally. naturally yeah. I mean, I was going to the. I started going to the gym more and more, and now that they're training more hours of training, so I guess if I don't, if I don't want to do it, why am I forcing? I'm not gonna force myself to do that. So it just came natural. I just wanted to do more and more. You guys, anyone else have any other questions? Are you guys excited to get back in the gym? Who's nervous that they're gonna, they forgot all their skills? <laughs> so, like riding a bike. Yeah. I forget. So let me ask you a question. Um, how many of you guys have a bike at home, a bicycle? You don't have a bicycle, Thomas? Do you know how to ride a bike? <laughs> kind of. So Andrew, Amali, and Bryn, every spring when it starts to get warm again, do you put on your training wheels on your bike again? No, but you don't ride a bike for the whole winter for months and months and months. But so you just remember how to do it? Yeah. Why? Because you don't overthink it, right? You don't lose that skill. You don't lose your balance. You're just, but it, I guarantee you, if you were to think, oh, did I forget how to ride a bike? 
then you'd start to get nervous, right? Then it'd be a little bit more difficult of a challenge to get on your bike in the spring, right? So make sure you guys just stay calm and trust your coach. Your coach is going to make you go and learn to your harder skills the first day. Your coach is going to take you, you know, gradually get you back to where you were. So make sure that you trust your coaches, okay? And, and just be a robot, okay? You don't, have to, you don't have to do anything. Just listen and do, listen and do. And after enough listening, you'll feel confident and calm again. And you won't lose any skills. You guys have any more questions? Really? <laughs> Molly's thinking. <laughs> Are you guys going to come visit, visit us again at ETA this year? Maybe hopefully this year, maybe next year? Hopefully. Yeah. Um, we've been talking about it and then the pandemic hit. Right. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, if you guys host the clinic, we'll, we'll be there. Nice. Molly's ready. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Molly. Um, what was it like um, competing in the Olympics? So competing in the Olympics was super stressful. Right, it was really, really difficult because I was the only, per only male competing for USA. So like, it wasn't like okay, if I mess up, at least my teammate can do good, and USA won't look so bad, right? No, like all the pressure was on me. So it was really, really stressful. Um, and looking back, I think it didn't need to be. You know, I should have r realized that everybody's not like putting pressure on me, but everyone had my support. You know, even after I had messed up in the Olympics, like I was leaving with my head down, looking at my feet, trying not to make eye contact with anybody. And people were like, yeah, USA, like, thank you so much. We were so happy that we could, you know, cheer for you. And we had an American and we were, you know, pulling for you. And we're just so proud of all the hard work that you went through to get here. And like, and then I, I realized like these people aren't here, like yelling at me, like you have to do good. You have to win the gold for USA. You know, they were there to support me. And so I, I wish I had realized that a little bit earlier. Um, and the same thing, like, you know, with your family and your friends, everyone was there to support me. So it was stressful. And looking back, it didn't need to be. Andrew, you had another question? Um, what was your favorite skill and why did you like it? Ooh, your favorite skills, Miller? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I Do you have that. another favorite skill? I don't know. I like the running. Cool, Brandy. So my favorite skill was a Miller Plus. So it's a double layout with four twists, a double full and then a double full in the second flip. Um, and the hardest tricks that I ever did in my whole life, which weren't my favorite because they were so stinking hard, um, but they were fun to do because I had a lot of adrenaline and I had to go really jump really high and try really hard. I did a Miller Plus Plus, which is a double layout with five twists. So I basically did like a double full in the first flip and then a triple full in the second flip. And then I also did a triple twisting triple back. So in a pike position. So I did a back full and a half, triple front pike, and then a full and a half a Rudy at the end. Thomas, did you have another question? Um, what was your favorite moment from a competition that you did? Favorite moment? Do you have a favorite moment? I guess Worlds. I think, I guess, I think Worlds 2018. Um, I always put so much pressure on myself that I knew I could be top 24, make the same finals, top eight, make the finals. And I always that, had that pressure on my, on my hand that I had to do well to be at that top with the with the top girls and I went up messing up. I kept messing up and not show the hard work that I have put in the gym. So in 2018 I finally realized that I don't have to put so much pressure. I don't have to be at the top. I go there and I do what I've been doing at the gym and the and the final result it's what it is. If I did my best, I'll be happy with that. No matter if I'm last or if I'm first, right? If I did my best, I'll be happy with it. So I got there and I did two of pretty good routines, compulsory and optional. And even before the, the results, I was just really happy with, with how I did. I ended up being 13th, going to semifinals. And then at semifinals, I did the same thing. I was like, I don't care. I'm already here. I'm at the semifinals for the first time. 
and it's something that I've been working for years. That was my fifth world championships. So at the semifinals, I performed a really good routine. I had a little trouble on the outbounds, but I had the same feeling as Steven. I, I cried for as a relief because I finally showed off what I, I was working for. And I finished 14th. It was the best result for Brazil. So um, I think when you just get your mind in the right place, right, uh, you don't have to stress yourself so much if you worked for it. Um, did you guys want to talk a little bit about uh, when you competed in synchro or trained synchro? We only have one trampoline. So if we have a synchro team, we kind of, we mm -hmm. have a metronome. So my synchro, so I live in, on the Jersey shore in New Jersey and my synchro partner lived 3,400 miles away from me. My synchro partner lived in Laguna, California, like almost literally the only, the only way you could possibly get any farther is if I lived in like Maine, I guess, then it would be like a few hundred miles more. Um, and it, I think it's something that I, I never really practiced much synchro in the gym. I wish I had, but it's something that, you know, came pretty naturally. Um, and I think there's ways to train it and be good at it without doing synchro. So kind of like, so synchronize is kind of, it's like cognitive decision-making, right? Cognitive meaning like in your subconscious, right? You're not, you're not thinking about reach up, tuck, kick out, wait, are they kicking out, right? It's kind of like breathing, it happens naturally, right? And so one good thing that you, I think you guys can do to practice this in order to get better at synchro, if that's something that you, you know, would like to get good at, one great thing, there's, well, two great things. Number one is juggling, right? So juggling, you have to throw the ball up, watch where that's going, throw the next one. You basically have to know where two balls are going at the same time and where to move both hands. And you can't look at both hands at the same time. So you kind of have to make that decision to think, thinking two things at the same time. Another thing is learning how to read music. How many of you guys play an instrument? Anybody? Yeah. Sweet. Nice. So learning how to read music, right? You're just looking at a dot on the page and your brain has to very quickly realize, does that dot mean I hold it for one note, two, four, right? Is it A, B, C, D? Is it flat? Is it sharp? Right. And then if you're playing and then you have to analyze all of that. And then your brain has to send the message to your fingers as to where to move them, whether you're playing the piano or saxophone or whatever instrument, right? And so all of this has to happen while you're already looking at the next note, right? So you're doing many, many things at the same time and your brain's focusing on two things at the same time, kind of like synchro. You have to focus on what you're doing and what someone else is doing, whether they're higher or lower. Um, so, but I never, I never trained synchro really much in well, my, my single partner lives in brazil and <laughs> we finished fourth at world championships last year um i did synchro my whole life so i had a part in my gym that, that's for sure um a good thing on my side but right now what we do we just talk about a routine that we both can do through iMessage and uh, we time our routine to see if we're doing the same time right if she's jumping a little lower I will do my a little lower or or the opposite so I think that's something we could work for you guys too <laughs> technology <laughs> yeah that's crazy yeah. well you guys said you had to be smart at four right yeah we have to go coach our next group <laughs> yep. well if no our one fitness. has any more questions um, this was great thank you so much for speaking and um, hopefully we'll see you at a clinic soon or me. I hope so. I certainly hope so. I'm starting to get a little stir crazy here without any trampolines. Yeah. So make sure you guys, make sure you guys, I'll leave you guys with this, with this last message, right? Now, training on the trampoline sucks when your legs are sore, when your muscles are aching, right? Tumbling is, is no fun when your arms are so tired, you can't even hold a handstand, right? So take that opportunity now to get stronger and to get more flexible. Be sore now because you don't have to go to the gym and tumble and, and do trampoline and, and all that stuff. So get stronger now. This is a great opportunity to increase your strength and to increase your flexibility so that when you get back in the gym, you won't be so sore when you're starting to train. All right? Well, it was good talking with you guys. I hope to see you guys soon. All right? All right. Stay safe, you. everybody. Bye, guys.
Bye. Bye.